We're now thinking about the pituitary gland and it is a particularly fascinating gland with an amazing array of functions. Now if we think about our brain here, then we have the brain, the top part as you know is the cerebrum, then the cerebellum and the brain stem. Just there. Then the pituitary gland is on a little stalk, just there like that, descending from the base of the cerebrum. So cerebrum, cerebellum, brain stem, pituitary gland. And it sits in a nice little cup in the skull called the pituitary fossa. Now, the gland itself is actually in two lobes. So it comes down from the, imagine that's the part of the brain there. So it's got a, it's got a part of the brain. And then it's got a bit of a stalk. It kind of dangles a bit on a bit of a stalk. And then it broadens out like this. And that would be the rest of the brain there. Now this top part of the brain here that the pituitary gland is so intimately related with is the hypothalamus. So the pituitary gland is very closely related with the hypothalamus. And it's in two lobes of the pituitary gland. It's got a front lobe and it's got a back lobe. So this lobe here, this lobe here is at the front. And this lobe here is at the back. So we call the lobe at the front, of course, the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland. And the one at the back is the posterior, the posterior lobe. Now the, the back lobe, the posterior lobe, is made out of neurological tissue. Can you see it's continuous with the brain? And if it's made out of neurological tissue, it's given a name called the neuro hypo. Neuro hypophysis. Now the hypophysis is the correct name for the pituitary gland. So we've got neuro, neurological tissue, hypophysis, pituitary gland. That's at the back, that's the posterior lobe. <clears throat> now the anterior lobe at the front, this bit here, which is the larger lobe actually, is made of glandular tissue. It's glandular, and the word for glandular is adeno. So the anterior lobe is the adenohypophysis, made of glandular tissue. And the two lobes have separate sets of functions. Now, the <clears throat> neurohypophysis, as we've said, is, is well related to the hypothalamus. And in fact, in the hypothalamus, there are a range of largish neurons, nerve cells, as you would expect with a nucleus and a cytoplasm and a cell membrane. You would expect them to be neurological because they're in the, in the brain after all. And these have long axons, long axons that go down into the neurohypophysis. Now what's actually happening here is secretory products <coughs> are produced in these cell bodies. And what's called secretory vesicles, little bags of fluid in essence, carry these products down the stalk 
That's the stalk of the pituitary gland there. But these long axons carry the products down into the neurohypophysis, into the posterior lobe. <coughs> and from here, um, at the appropriate times, they will be released. And there is a good blood supply. So there's an arterial supply dividing into numerous capillaries. Draining via small veins going through the posterior lobe. So that means that when these endocrine products are produced by the neurons in the hypothalamus, travel down, undergo this process of neurosecretion, then there's a very vascular part of the gland here and the products go directly into the blood. And this is the systemic circulation. So from here, the products will travel all around the body. There will be systemic distribution of products going around the body. And there are two hormones produced by the hypothalamus secreted via the neurosecretory processes via the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland. By the way, there's about 10,000 or more of these neurons. I've only drawn one. They form a tract going down through the stalk. So about 10,000 neurosecretory neurons. Now, one of the hormones produced is oxytocin. Oxytocin. So oxytocin is produced by the posterior lobe. And another one that's produced by the posterior lobe is the antidiuretic. The antidiuretic hormone. But let's look at these in turn. First of all, oxytocin. Now, oxytocin the release of oxytocin is stimulated in, uh, in labour and delivery and facilitates contraction of the uterus. So the oxytocin will cause the uterine smooth muscle to contract, to expel the, the term baby for delivery. So it contracts the uterine muscle. That's why we use oxytocin sometimes to induce labour and we can also use it to treat PPHs, postpartum hemorrhages. So after delivery, the, uh, the uterus can be bleeding and the oxytocin will clamp it down to reduce the bleeding. So it contracts the uterine muscles. And it also is stimulated by the child uh, suckling at the, uh, the nipple. And that generates what's called the uh, the letdown reflex. It will result in the contraction of the milk ducts in the breast facilitating lactation. And a few years ago that's probably all I would have told you about oxytocin. But now it seems to be involved in many other emotional aspects of life. So the oxytocin seems to be involved in mother-baby bonding, giving rise to feelings of love. And it's also involved in many human relationships, loving relationships, uh, romantic relationships. So it's a bit of a, it's a bonding hormone, really. It promotes bonding. It promotes uh, long-term relationships, which, of course, is what we need for the propagation of the species. And it also seems to reduce uh, cytokines and inflammation. So... It may well be that social interactions, the way that you interact with your patients socially, can increase the amount of oxytocin they produce um, because of social interactions, and that can actually promote wound healing processes. Interesting. And it's also involved in the sexual response, generating... Um, well, it can generate things like contentment, and it can reduce anxiety and calmness and uh, security things that improve long-term bonding. So quite a range of um, activities really for oxytocin. Now the other hormone from the um, 
posterior lobe of the pituitary gland, the neurohypophysis, is the antidiuretic hormone. Now, antidiuretic hormone, I think you can see that a, a diuretic, a diuretic such as fruzoamide, will increase urine volumes. So the antidiuretic hormone is going to reduce urine volumes. It conserves water. And it will do the same actually in sweat glands. The antidiuretic hormone will reduce the amount of sweat that the body produces. So the antidiuretic hormone is about conserving body water, reducing urine volumes and reducing sweating. So it does those things. But when it was originally discovered, the antidiuretic hormone was actually given a different name. It was called vaso. Pressin. Vasopressin. And this is because it vasoconstricts blood vessels. It vasoconstricts blood vessels. And if you constrict blood vessels, you will increase peripheral resistance and that will increase blood pressure. So vasopressin will increase blood pressure via the mechanism of widespread peripheral vasoconstriction. But it's not doing that all the time. So it's not playing a part in day-to-day -day blood pressure regulation in you at the moment. <coughs> what happens is that if your blood pressure drops dramatically, for example, if you have a hemorrhage or a severe diarrhea or burns and you develop hypovolemia, then as a result of that hypovolemia, that will stimulate the release of vasopressin in large amounts. And only when it's released in large amounts in these emergency situations will it cause the vasoconstriction to maintain blood pressure in emergency situations. So that's the first part of our consideration of the pituitary gland, looking at the neurohypophysis. What we haven't considered yet is the anterior lobe, which is here. This is the glandular part. And this releases a range of hormones called trophic. Trophic hormones. And these trophic hormones from the adenohypophysis, from the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland, regulate the function of virtually all of the rest of the parts of the endocrine system. And that will be the topic of the next video in this endocrine series.